<laughs> okay, hi everyone. Um, we're joined today by Jeremy Tous. He and I used to work together um, as e-commerce executives for the French and German markets at a big international UK-based e-commerce seller for the home market. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Jeremy. Can you kind of introduce yourself a little bit with, you know, something about you and your position, maybe a fun fact or two about yourself? So first and foremost, thanks for having me, Belinda, and hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Jeremy. I'm originally from France, and I've lived in the UK now for seven years. Um, so I guess that's my fun fact. I was meant to come for a year and never went home. And <laughs> to stay here. Um, met great people along the way um, and started a career in e-commerce. So I currently work as a brand manager for a UK um, home specialized uh, e-commerce group. And I oversee the French and German websites. So my team and I all together look after all marketing channels um, for France and Germany. Awesome. Sounds like you have your hands full, which I remember even when we were working together a couple of years ago, that was the case. So I can only imagine how much has come onto your plate since then. Um, thank you for introducing yourself, Jeremy. So the reason we're doing this video today is to kind of get a feel for how um, e-commerce and translation work together, how e-commerce marketers and translators like myself can work together to um, achieve the best possible outcome, the best results. Um, and to start off, I have a quote that I, I picked up during a CIOL webinar in September of last year. It was held by Teresa Sousa. Um, and the quote says, 81% of shoppers research their product online before purchasing. So taking that quote, Jeremy, what's the most common or the most important thing that you think shoppers look for online? I think this answer can be really long or really short, depending how you look at it. But as a marketer and a consumer, I would just assume detailed, informative content. Being able, as a customer or as a marketer, to identify quickly what the product or the service is. And this is what we have to deal in e-commerce, that we very often don't have that physical presence. So we want the content to as accurately as possible to either describe the product you're trying to sell or the service you're offering uh, to someone, really. So I think in-depth and thorough content, if that makes sense. That's definitely, especially for the German and the French market. I remember um, that was a common thing, like make sure, because I remember that we, we always used to write something, we always used to use the English as our base. And I remember the English being very flo like floral, we say in German, you know, like very yeah. uh, pretty. It's and then uh, the German and the French were like, okay, that's nice. Like German and French customers. I'm a, I'm a German customer. Like, okay, that's nice. But I need more input. I need more details about the technology and how it works. Do you think that's specifically true for France, France and Germany? It is very much. We are very much, which I believe, again, um, being very much like information focused and driven. So mm -hmm. I want to be told you know, what is the unique selling point of this product? What are the dimensions? Or what am I getting when I purchase this product? And we don't necessarily need that flowery and heavy adjectives in a sentence mm -hmm. um, telling us how amazing it is. We want sort of the product to show that and not some content to tell us um, how great the product is. So I think we're more mm -hmm. details and fact orientated mm -hmm. than some other cultures. So I think that's why also we need to adapt and whilst we have a UK content maybe as a base or some other sites or languages might have another language as a base, but it's important that we either in-house or work with a translator to recreate that content and make it fit to the market sort of expectations and needs, really. That leads us perfectly into our next question, which would be how can the marketing team, at, in your case, you and your team, and then the translator in that case, me, how can we work together to achieve the best possible out, outcome from a content perspective? So I think communication is key. Um, obviously, if we take this example of my team working with you, um, you being based of remotely, we'd have to provide you with all the information for the product or the service or anything really we're trying to sell to the customer. So maintaining that communication, making sure that you provide a brief as detailed as possible with 
on any terms that you likely or keywords that you want to cover or the demographics of the market you're trying to reach. So making sure that that communication goes both way as well. So hearing what the team has to say, but also hearing what the translator has to say and how what what works best for both really. Like this is a two-way communication and I think that's what really is key to the success making sure that all key information of the product or the unique selling points are sort of shared be between both um, parties, really. Yeah, two-way communication, definitely, definitely. I remember when um, both when we used to work there together, but also after um, I left the company, I still worked with you, um, as you just mentioned, as a remote um, translator and doing product descriptions mainly in some, some blog and website content. And I remember that you and your, one of your colleagues and I, uh, for Germany, we had like a whole term-based glossary going and it kept, as we worked together for like a year, it kept growing and growing and growing. And by the end of it, it was a really valuable document to pass on to the next in-house um, translator. And do you think that um, there can be some really horrible translation mistakes or not even just mistake in terms of spelling or grammar, but something that can go terribly wrong if you don't have that communication and that um, willing to work together productively. Oh, yeah, because you could completely miss the point that we might be going into one direction, trying to sell a product as luxury or, I don't know, have a specific vision for that product. But if there's not that communication, you might, from the limited information you have, might go in a different direction that we've thought of going, so you end up so having a very counterproductive relationship again, it's always going back to maintaining that relationship and making sure that it's both ways. I think, and that thing that is the key. If you are working not only with a with a translator, with someone freelance outside your company, is making sure that you communicate and are very clear with what you're trying to achieve. What are the goals of this piece of content you're translating, or really what direction this project is taking? So. Horrible fails are possible, but you can sort of fight it and avoid them if you really have that communication, that open communication and, and sort of set expectations, what you're trying to achieve and what you're sort of expecting out of um, that person you're working with. What are, what are like some common uh, customer complaints that you get that can be traced back to either the original copy in English or the translation for the German or French market, because that's what you have experience with. Um, so I think a lot of it will be, because there's always several parties involved. So for example, you would maybe getting your information from a product team that has got that information from a ma manufacturer. So they are multiple sort of people involved along the whole translation project. So some information might get lost in transit and you're translating something and then it turns out that the customer might get the product and it's ever so slightly different. And so it could be traced back that the content that we've originally translated wasn't necessarily 100% accurate, or it could be that the content has been updated and like someone has forgotten to update it, or simply that the person that wrote the content um, used a term that wasn't necessarily 100% correct. So there's multiple scenarios possibly possible and possible reason really for an error to happen. Um, but I would say a lot of the time it would be because there was that miscommunication or sort of mm -hmm. errors along the way that sort of cascade down um, and result to maybe wrong information displayed on site or maybe information that the customer might not necessarily understand because we have to remember that we are sort of experts in our market. So we know all the technical <laughs> vocabulary and um, something that might be straightforward for us might not be as common knowledge as we thought it would be. So in multiple scenarios, really, multiple potential explanation, but it's, um, it happens quite frequently that a customer would ring up or email back and ask for some further explanation or point that things are ever so slightly wrong uh, on the site. Yeah, there was, there was often the case that we needed to update copy based on a customer complaint or maybe even based on um, a certain model of shower, for example, not being in stock anymore. And it was kind of quietly replaced by something else, you know, without making a big deal out of it, like just introducing new stock with a really similar model. But that means like, for example, the color had to be updated or 
you know, some something in the description wasn't quite like instead of matte, it was suddenly glossy. That kind of stuff happens quite often, don't you? Do you agree? And exactly, it's it's just that it's a very sort of very fast paced industry mm -hmm. where um, components might be changing, um, sizes might be changing. Um, so from one batch to another, there might be you know like a 50 millimeter difference but we owe it to be updated on the site to reflect that there's some content changes and mm -hmm. that for our descriptions or copy on the site to always be as accurate as possible really that's a really good point thank, thank you for sharing that um i think that's something that some um amazon sellers or in general even if e-commerce sellers have their own website i think that's something that often that gets neglected also also kind of going together with translation again where something changes on the site, like a product might be out of stock or replaced by new stock. Um, but many sellers have like this set it and forget it mentality where you see really, really, like you really make sure that everything is up to date. And you also let your translator know to please update the copy, um, update the translation. So um, I think that's, that's really valuable. When we were working together, there was a task that we did, I think pretty much on a weekly basis, we would always make sure that, because we both worked in PPC, which stands for pay per click. So we would create Google ads and Bing ads. Bing is a, obviously a big um, search engine in Germany for anyone who might be wondering. And um, so our, one of our tasks was to make sure that our ads were still on page one of the Google search results, um, or actually in place one is, is what, I'm, what I meant. So. So what's the most frequent change that you and your team make to those PPC ads when they're kind of drifting off to a lower position? I think the first thing that we, we have to, to do is obviously look at all technical sort of PPC um, areas. So what, how much are we willing to pay for a click? Can we increase this? Like how much are we wanting to drive traffic? So we review all technical sort of paid activity um, bits. But there's also another um, section that we tend like to forget, I think, is also reviewing the content aspect. So is your title still accurately representing the product? Um, are we, do we need to update the imagery? Do we need to update the descriptions? So it's sort of really a joint effort that is the PPC team having to review, you know, like reviewing things such as bids and feed information. But it's also the content team um, having to really sort of go through that content and make sure that what we are presenting the customer is still accurate and should be really displayed. Mm -hmm. Similar to a general, like your even your website, your Amazon, your eBay listings, like it all should be up to date. And obviously, same for and especially for paid ads, because that's where all the budget, you know, goes. So that's a really, really good tip. Speaking of making things easier to find or putting them in a higher position. There's um, obviously this big, big question about keywords. Um, and uh, we were already kind of on the track here with PPC. And there was also a question from um, Jessica from LinkedIn who asked about keywords and how important keyword research is in, um, in, um, in e-commerce or in general in marketing. So I thought I'd start us off by um, with, with a really interesting example of keywords that can be good or fail, <laughs> a really bad fail. Um, also, this, in, this was also mentioned in that webinar that I uh, talked about before, um, the CIOL webinar about um, SEO translation. Um, so a good keyword, for example, always uh, leaves no room for doubt and is something that the consumer would actually type into their search engine to find a certain product. Um, there was a funny example about a keyword, Windows security. And I think the seller was trying to, you know, something about actual windows and making them safe so that no robbers could come in. But it turns out that Windows security is much more often searched in connection with, uh, you know, Microsoft and um, security system, antivirus system. So that was obviously a very bad and ambiguous um, keyword. Do you think that there have been similar fails within the home decor area? Um, so um, I would use, in fact, a German example. Um, so there's different ways of different types of um, products like realtors, for example, have different names. And it's very common in certain markets that we can refer to one product uh, different ways. Um, but there's issues, for example, with Flachheitskörper, which to me as a non-native German speaker, and if I use my brain to translate it, I would expect it to see a, a very flat radiator. However, in Germany, Flachheitskörper are a type of radiator that are not only flat, but they are convectors. 
So depending on how and what you search for, you might get two different results, like both redditors and half reaching the point, but <laughs> not exactly what the customer might be searching at that point. So context helps um, the type of research, if we can see and identify different trends in search terms mm -hmm. and all of that will help to understand. But fails are common and you learn and this is why you tweak, you tweak your beads, you review search terms and you review all sorts of, of PPC um, metrics to make sure that you target each um, campaign, target the right set of keywords. And why can't you, for anyone who is not familiar with translation or e-commerce that much, how, why can't you just go ahead and um, take your tried and tested English keywords and simply translate it for your German, French, that whatever market? Um, again, going back to multiple, or each territory has a different way or multiple ways of describing certain products. But if we take a, a very um, a simple example, um, in the UK or in English speaking countries, you tend to call the tap, and I'm getting to this explanation, that allows you to turn your shower on and off as a shower valve. However, in countries like Holland, um, France, Germany, we refer to those as taps. So for us, it's a shower tap. It's not a shower valve, it's a shower tap. So if you just translate it literally, you would have, for example, a van de douche, which is something that exists, but it's completely different. It goes to your plumbing, something behind your showers. Um, so it's important that you just um, assess the market, do your research and understand that sometimes it's one word, but that one word means a completely different product. It's absolutely different. But then there's also keywords that are a bit more vague and broad, like a bathroom tap. It could be a tap for your sink, it could be a tap for your bath, but it also could be a tap for your shower. <laughs> so you would have to have more background in order to tailor those keywords to the actual market um, and just make sure that you target keywords that are actively, actively and thoroughly representing the products you're trying to sell. So yes, uh, doing some keyword research, putting yourself in the shoes of your ideal customer is really important. Would you also agree that cultural sensitivity uh, and a cultural awareness uh, for what people might be looking for in a particular country is important? Oh, definitely. Um, you'd have, you also would have, either you as a translator or me as a marketer for the French and German market, I am experienced and I have knowledge of the French and German markets, for example. So I can draw from my own personal experience and life in France or in Germany um, to really sort of put myself in the customer's shoes, shoes and sort of think, if I were to look for a shower or a bath, what would I type on the internet to be presented those um, ads or products really? So using having that cultural knowledge is an advantage that as marketers we need to utilize and, and make the most of. So draw from your own experience, but also like what are the marketing sites that you can find online? Mm -hmm. What are the trends? And, and it's, it's very funny. Um, the French market um, seems to be very driven by traditional looking products or the ret retro style and like vintage styles. Well, the German market is sort of more driven by mm -hmm. modern looking products. So whilst there are neighboring countries, the, the patterns and are completely different, really. So it's very interesting on a day-to-day -to, -day to sort of compare and look at differences in like in buying um, buying style or just preferences, really, in terms of product and design and colors. And, and, and that's, I think, something as well that we need to draw upon and make sure that we remember when we write um, content or create PPC ads, really. 100%. That's a really good example that you mentioned about the style in France and Germany. Even though they're right next to each other, their, their style couldn't be, their preferences couldn't be more different. I, I would also say, like, Germans love the modern bathroom style. I, I was surprised, like, actually not surprised when you think, like, France, France and England are much closer together when it comes to, like, their, their bathroom preferences and vintage or retro, as you call it. it actually, also in German, yeah, retro, nostalgisch, uh, all those those types of words that we always used to target it in, in our ads. Um, before we get to our last question, I actually have um, 
Um, Olga from LinkedIn asked about a few things about um, the markets that uh, your company, your e-commerce company serves. So what languages, what markets do you cover? Um, and also, do you prefer working with in-house staff for your translations, agencies, or freelance translators? Can you tell us a little bit about all of that? So as Belinda said, at the beginning, uh, it's an international group. So we have um, some European sites, so present in uh, Italy, Spain, Holland, um, France, and Germany. Um, we also sell in the United States, um, and obviously um, we have uh, our main UK site. So I've worked with both um, in-house content and translator, as well as working with uh, with Belinda um, as sort of a, a free agent, a, a translator, and both work really great. Um, it's always going back to what I was saying before that communication. If you can build that communication with an external person, then it just feels like working that's in-house where you can really just communicate and I can go to their desk and sort of tell them um, what the brief is and, and what we're trying to achieve with that product. So I believe if you manage to reach a very successful both way relationship communication, then working externally is a bless, it's a blessing, it, it's amazing. Um, but I can see why some marketers can be sort of frightened by the idea of working with someone that's externally because it's hard to put your point across and really transfer and share and communicate and put together um, the project, really. Um, so I personally like both. Um, obviously, working with Belinda, um, we known each other, so the communication was there. It was very easy. It was very friendly. Uh, and we've made um, our several projects that we had together real successes. So it really, really depends, uh, I would say, on what sort of communication you can install um, with with your your translator in house or working with someone external. Really, that's perfect. That leads me to my last question, which is, what final tip would you give an e-commerce seller um, working with copywriters or translators? Um, I would say one: communicate to remember that you're not only writing for search engines, you're writing for human beings. So it's going back to that point where we're saying, if you were the customer and if you were reading the content or seeing the ad online or seeing the product, and if you were that customer, would you buy that product? If the answer is yes, is it's likely that you've done something great and you've done your translation as per the brief, really, because you're hitting all the key points. But if, as the person reading the content, you sort of think, no, I wouldn't necessarily buy this, then maybe it's worth going back over the content and try to improve it. Because if you don't want to buy something that you wrote, <laughs> no one else probably will want to buy it. So communicate. Try to put yourself in the customer's shoes and communicate again. <laughs> Perfect. I love. I also love the point about writing for um for humans and not just for search engines because that's also what translators like myself. Once you specialize in in marketing and even if you go a little bit into SEO, um, that's also something that you hear all the time. Like, yes, we have to do certain things and certain technical um tweaks to make sure that Google and Bing and whoever picks us up and picks up our content, but we also ultimately want to connect with fellow human beings who will be buying, hopefully buying the product. So that's really, really great. Thank you so much for all of your tips. And in general, thank you so much, Jeremy, for sharing all your experiences and tons of advice um, with us today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me and um, have a lovely rest of your day. No, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>